So, the problems as Team Femur that we're trying to solve are the sustainability with the teams, the local economy, and the perception of these teams. And something that's not done quite well, even here at home, is like if I go to the doctor's office, they don't know what they did because I grew up in Sterling Heights. Like they have no information on me. But I can still go down the street and find out what my neighbor ate for lunch yesterday. And there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to see your own medical records there. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, get all of these groups to give us their data, right? We don't want to force them to. We don't want to have some kind of agreement with them that says you have to give us your data. Because then inherently it becomes not free software in a sense that we're forcing the users to do something. We don't want to do that. Um, so we want to create this database that lets everybody see the patients in the area that they're traveling to. And we've got a grant submitted right now to try to refer these patients. We've been working with one of the phys uh, surgeons down there. We want to send them to physician that can perform surgery locally on these patients, right? So we want to work with the locals and make it, give a better perception to these teams. And some of the software stuff, um, right now when a, a group comes to us, I remote into a Linux laptop that they have and I set everything up, right? The automatic script on startup, um, installation of the application. And SPT lets you do a lot of things and one of those things is that when you build the project and you get all the dependencies, I want to stuff it all into a Debian package, right? So I can just go on this guy's laptop, double click it, everything gets installed, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so the other thing is um, unique identifiers. One of the students right now at Wayne State is actually working on this. She's doing a pretty good job so far. But right now, patient identifiers are the primary key in the patient table in the database. That's a terrible idea. That can change on, on anything. Um, it's working right now, but it's one of those things that we've didn't take into consideration when we started the project. When teams started coming and using the system in separate remote locations that can't talk to each other, sometimes these teams can get the same unique identifiers. So it's a problem that we've identified, and she's working on solving right now. She's doing a pretty good job. Biometric identification, that's one way of solving that problem, right? Because everybody's got a unique fingerprint. Um, iOS devices and Android devices, they can take fingerprints, but they don't let developers see the fingerprints. Apple sends it up into a cloud, and they'll match it for you, but they won't show you the fingerprint. I thought that was kind of funny. And the other thing is around ethics, right? You go into a country, we're going to take your population's fingerprints. It doesn't really go well. <laughs> um, the DNS issue, and we're, we're currently working through HIPAA. Um, HIPAA is a tough one. I think like once a week now, we start sitting down, like Saturday nights. I spend my Saturday nights drinking wine and going through HIPAA regulations, right? We're trying to <laughs> write a uh, guidelines for our organization. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's why I drink wine. <laughs> um, so in the other uh, thing, we, we just submitted a grant for this concept of femur in a box, where we call it this because what I want to do is, right now this team has to go down there with a server, a router, and some access points. Right? It's really simple. We've got it locked down to the point where it's plug and play. But really what should happen is it should just be a box that there's a button where you flick it on, and it creates a little internet for them to use the software on. Um, And then one of the things that I've really learned from working in open source is that you can take code and put it out on the internet, and yeah, it's open source, right? But building the community around the software is super important. And the way that you do that is you communicate to everybody, even the users, everything. Um, transparency is key. You want everybody to know what's wrong with the software. Mm -hmm. You want everybody to know all of the bugs in the software. And when there's problems, you don't want to have the discussions in private. You want to have those discussions on an open forum because people have ideas and they're actually good a lot of times. <laughs> but that's it. Thanks, guys. Can we open it to questions? Yeah, absolutely. I have a, oh, I have a suggestion for like your uh, femur in a box. Mm -hmm. The router section, or router part, there's uh, have you heard of, you know, the Raspberry Pi? Yep. There's a, another device called the Banana Pi. Okay. They make a Banana Pi R, okay. which is a router board. And it has, you know, the four ports or whatever for it. So you won't have, like, a big switch to plug into it. But you can run a custom router on that, custom firmware. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can run uh, DDWRT right now is one of them. Okay. I think they're working on PFSense is another router you can run on it. But that would have built-in... 
uh, DNS and a whole bunch of services you can run right there, even a file server you can run right built into it. So that would be good for something like your box. Yeah. And it's small, lightweight, low power. And so that's like, nice. That's and these yeah, things, um, they're open, right? So like I could take that hardware yeah, and, it's and use it in my own. Yeah, okay. Sure. So that's, that's exactly you can, what. You can get just the board so that you want to put it inside the box. You don't exactly. have to have whole case and separate. What did you call it? It's a banana pie. I think R2 is the latest version, or R1 or something. Uh, awesome. This one is an R1, but this is the first time I've heard about it. I'm yeah, it's really this. cool. It has a SATA controller built in, so you okay. can put just laptop hard drive straight on it, and then whatever in the, the router you set up, you can run a, a file server. How much so you can run all your backups to it. Right. I think the just the board is 40 bucks or 60 something like that, and then everything else you build on top of it. I priced it out. Okay. For what I wanted to run, it was like 120 bucks for a standalone router. Okay. It's like to replace your Linksys router or whatever at home. That's not really open. Yeah. Right. Um, and some of the ideas we had were around, because that box, you need the, the router and you also need the server. And so some of the ideas we were playing with initially was the Raspberry Pi with uh, for the server side. And one of the problems we ran into was I think it supports two gigs of memory right now. I think that's it. Not, I'm not too experienced yeah. in, in that area of Raspberry Pi and the banana pies. Right. You well, might look so at a Nook then. A Nook? Yeah. It, Intel Nook. It's another. It's a small a board, board. Small form factor board. Okay. So yeah, you're going to get to the point where you're going to have a, a data center and a suitcase, right? Yeah. And you just send the suitcase down there, and then they just pull yeah, all the stuff out. That's what we want to do. Like a Pelican case or something. The nice rugged plastic case with a handle yeah. on it. Yeah. You know, I would for the server I would stick with some kind of laptop because you got the keyboard screen and, and everything built in right there. So when they're not using it you can leave it shut with the lid yeah. on it or whatever. Yeah. And then when they need it you just open it up and it's everything's compact yeah. right there. And then kinda of have the banana pie separate. The banana pie would be yeah the, the separate router and that would do all the addressing and you can all configure the, it. Okay. Yeah. The DNS uh, and then if they happen to have an internet connection then you just plug in right there, and then all of a sudden, everybody in the on the network has internet. Interesting. Good idea. Yeah, thanks. So, go ahead. You go. No, no, go. On. I've been talking also. <laughs> when you, when your contributors um, clone your code, do they have to uh, build it and then uh, test it themselves, or do you have some sort of automated testing? In terms of like unit testing. Yes. Yeah. So we've got. I think five unit tests right now. Okay. Um, so we've just built up the framework for unit testing the software. Um, we use a lot of uh, dependency injection and a couple of different frameworks on the lower level there. So we've been working on figuring that out. I think we finally got it figured out. So there's a little bit of automated testing, and there's day by day a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Um, um, go ahead. I submitted an issue uh, mentioning Travis CI. It's a it's an open source continuous integration tool. Um, you. You point this service, which is free, at your GitHub repository, and then it will continuously build your code. Um, it, you can set it up to build when people submit uh, commits, and those commits get merged. And then on your actual GitHub page, you can see if your entire project is passing or failing. Uh, is so that where that little icon comes from yes. where it says pass? Okay. Yes. So I'm not, doing, I'm not following some of that. So the idea is you have like regression, uh, regression tests, uh, regression tests, regression tests, right? So is that what you're saying? You, you build up a set of tests and it will run the tests for you? Yes. Okay. All right. So you still have to build up the tests, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But at a bare minimum, you should at least be able to compile the code. Yeah. I mean, that's that's yeah. the first test. If it's not compiling, then there's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you see that sometimes on some pages. Sure. Yeah. I'll go to some uh, GitHub pages and it'll be like failing. Yeah, I've seen that yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. I've seen it's that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First rule: don't break the build. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, this uh, EMR, I'm curious how how big the EMR is. What what features you have in the EMR? I, I've been working in the EMR field for a long, long time. Okay. Um, and we've got you know we've got e-prescribing. There's an awful lot of stuff we have in our EMR that you, you would probably never need. Right. So, and some of those are like insurance modules. And, insurance, and, scheduling, and yep. billing, and. Yep. <laughs> all that stuff. So the teams that we send down, they have had no training almost. Like I've yeah. talked to them for maybe 10 minutes before yeah. they go, and it's designed so that you can use it that quickly. The, the features that it has are... 
you have a live version to? Yeah, I do. I make no guarantee of what kind of information is in it, though. <laughs> this is open to a lot of people. <laughs> um, what does EMR stand for? EMR is electronic medical records. Okay. And so there's, they make a distinction out there because my original slide had EHR, mm -hmm. which is electronic health records. And when they use the term EHR, they're usually talking about um, the bigger picture of not just the EMR tool, but combining all the data and everything else that comes along with the data from the e EMR. Okay. That's usually the distinction they make. So I don't That's quite right. get that distinction. I mean, so it's health is more than just recording. It's, it's You're not the only one that doesn't get it. Yeah. No. It's, yeah, it seems that EHR is more, that's more current terminology. I work for a company that actually develops EMR software, so I find this very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just the pattern I've seen is it's, it's when you're doing more with the data, kind of more around, more than just the EMR system itself. It's, uh, Can you give okay. an example where they do more? So, like, taking that database, all the data from all the different teams and combining it, then you become an electronic health record system because you're doing more than just using this little e the, the EMR tool, okay. if that makes you're sense. You're aggregating data from all You're aggregating places. data, you're doing other things on top of the EMR tool, then you yeah. become an electronic health record system. That's what I've seen out there. Uh, so this is the tool. We recently did this little search because with the patients not being able to give you the same name every time, yeah. it becomes kind of hard to find them. Um, so we have so where it'll automatically go through and pull the different patients, and then it'll have um, pictures to help try to identify them. Um, and that was one of the things that the team requested because they tried to use it. WH, the, the Wayne State School of Medicine tried to use it um, to match patients to that so it's, it's manual face recognition? Yeah. Yeah. So now you just find an automatic face recognition. That would be and ideal. The person walks yeah. up and boom, now you have their record. It's yeah. for confirmation that you found the right record. Yeah. So there's a really basic in patient intake form. Um, 